Hello. Um, we are here with uh, Judge Nelson Lee, who is running for King County Superior Court position 19. Uh, would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to chat with you briefly. My name is Nelson Lee, and I was appointed by Governor Inslee to the King County Superior Court bench position 19 on February the 18th of this year. Um, I have to run for re-election to retain my seat, and that's why I'm before you this evening. A little bit about myself. I am the son of immigrants. Uh, my father immigrated to the United States, um, having fled China during the Communist Revolution. And my mother came to the United States um, about eight years after the war, uh, the end of the Second World War from Japan. And they met here. Um, although as soon as I was born, uh, we, we moved around the world because of my father's job. And that's significant because it has allowed me to live in multiple countries during my lifetime. But um, having lived in Nigeria during much of my childhood, that's really where my sense of community service was really instilled in me at an early age by my parents. Um, I recall fondly when I was about six years old, um, they enrolled me in a local a preschool in Nigeria, but um, on the weekends, I remember my mother taking me to an orphanage um, almost every weekend where we would volunteer and, and basically spend time with the kids and playing with them. Well, at least that was my role. Um, and what they wanted to teach me was uh, the value of community and to give back to the community, um, in particular because we were visitors in this country. And so I've carried that with me. And when I had the opportunity after law school to work, I applied both to actually the public defender's office um, and the King County prosecutor's office because I knew I wanted to be in the courtroom. And it just happened that the prosecutors were the first to give me a job offer. And after graduating law school, I worked there for 17 years, um, trying cases from DWIs all the way up to homicides and sex offenses. In late 2010, I left the office to start my own law practice with my wife, Bethany. Thank you, Judge Nelson. I'm okay. so sorry, that's your time. All right, thank you. Hi, uh, I forgot to mention, Alice is keeping time and okay. she'll let you know uh, when, uh, when we're time's up. Yep. Uh, and I will actually, just so you know, I'm gonna give you a heads up during, uh, for one minute and 30 seconds um, during your answers. So don't be worried that I'm interrupting you. I'm just letting you know. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, usually we have a little a little sign that we hold up. So uh, it looks like Robert sort of went ahead and posted the questions into the chat box. Um, Lori, would you like to go ahead with question one? Sure. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Appreciate your time. What are the pros and cons of going to the bench as compared to practicing law? Well, um, the pro is, and it's the reason I sought appointment to the bench, <laughs> is that I think it allows a person great, the greater ability to conduct and carry out justice. So when you represent either the state and or one particular party, um, be it a criminal defendant, an immigrant, um, someone who's been wronged in some way, you are obviously able to advocate on behalf of that person, um, whichever side you represent. But that has limited control over the outcomes. And I think it's important to have a fair and impartial and experienced judge uh, to be able to sort through all of the issues um, and try to administer justice. And so going back to my love of um, community service, this is why I'm seeking um, retention on the bench is because I went, I'm returning to public service, which is my first love. And I think as a judge, the big pro would be that I can weigh all of the evidence and have a great effect on actual um, the carrying out of justice. A con would be that um, as a judge, we basically have to put not just a filter, but a muzzle, if you will, on any opinions and feelings that we have about important issues, um, at least in public. At home, obviously, and amongst friends, I can discuss those openly. But in order to be neutral and maintain that um, air of neutrality, I am not able to be as vocal and be involved in a community as much seconds. as I would like. So. Thank you. Um, Summer, would you like to ask question two?
Summer, you're on mute. Sorry, uh, hold on, go back to the chat. Uh, what have been the most effective methods for improving court procedures and efficiency? What other methods would you suggest? Well, um, so actually I think, and I've only been on the bench for a couple of weeks, I was sworn in on April 6th, but to be honest with you, I think this pandemic has been um, the silver lining to it in terms of the perspective from the court is that it has forced judges to think outside the box um, as opposed to just sort of carrying out business as usual. So the court has been, it's not completely shut down, we're on limited um, functioning, but nonetheless, there are important hearings such as bond hearings or bail hearings that are being conducted as well as some important pretrial motions and other hearings that can be conducted by the over the phone or through Zoom. Um, so what that's done, I think, is made us, made all of us a lot more um, cognizant of the issues that people are facing, that I think it's helped judges to revisit their attitudes towards bail. Um, traditionally, it's supposed to be, by law, um, a method only to protect the community One and or to secure someone's presence. But a lot of times it's become uh, sort of punitive based on the amount of bail that we traditionally being asked for. So I think this pandemic um, and the challenges that we face are making us at this point become better judges um, and administrators of justice. What other methods would I suggest would be that judges need to get together and lobby our government um, organizations to come up with better resources and partnerships because the lack of funding is one of the major obstacles through access to justice in our system. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, would you like to ask question three? Sure, as a judge, what would you consider your greatest strengths and weaknesses? Huh. So my greatest strengths, I think, as a judge would be the um, the diversity in my life experiences. So as I mentioned, I was a prosecutor for 17 years. And then for the last 10 years, I have represented people who've been injured, who've been wrongfully terminated from their jobs. Um, and also I have been doing a great number of immigration cases as well, representing people who are seeking to enter the United States for work um, or family-based um, applications as well as refugees. Um, and so, uh, it's the diversity of my experience, I think, that is important to the bench. Um, additionally, I think my temperament and my patience, um, while it has been tested, I think I carry, I'm pretty even keeled. Um, one of the things I point to is that when I was a prosecutor, a public defender named Randy Hall kept me on the jury um, of a case that was being prosecuted by my office at the time, the King County Prosecutor's Office, and in fact, the prosecutor was a friend of mine as well. And I think that speaks, speaks to the confidence that he had in me uh, in terms of being a fair and impartial person. One of my weaknesses, I think, is that, and this was evident when I pro temed as a judge and had to cover multiple small claims calendars. Um, initially, it was a lot more difficult than I had anticipated because you can understand, I think, for the most part, both sides of an argument. Um, and sometimes seconds. there's a tendency, there's a tendency to want to sort of split the, go down the middle and, and sort of make people somewhat pleased, but not completely angry at you. Um, that has been something I've had to work on and just try to focus on doing what the law allows me to do, consider the facts and the law, weighing the case, and then ultimately deciding as it should be decided. Um, but, but I think one of the challenges is to sort of setting aside those type of human sentiments and emotions and try to focus on really just on the law. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Robert, would you like to ask question four? Yes, uh, describe your most difficult case. Why was it difficult and how did you handle it? So I, I would have to say, um, and there are more than, there's more than one, but I, but I think the one that challenged me the most that I can really speak to is um, the case of State versus Charles Champion, which was a death penalty case. Um, I inherited it from somebody, and at the time, I was um, still uncertain as to my feelings about the death penalty in Washington. And that 
occurred, um, I took over that case, which, which was on the trial calendar for about five years, right after the Green River Killer um, case had been resolved. And so the defense were mounting repeated motions saying that if it's cruel and unusual to try to seek the, um, the execution of a person, notwithstanding the fact that he had been accused of murdering a police officer, when the state had neglected to or chose to not to seek the death penalty in one of our most, against one of our most prolific serial killers. Um, but I, the decision, I guess, was made, the decision was made easier for me in a sense that it was, there were a lot of evidentiary issues such that I didn't believe the state could prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. And because of that, it allowed me the opportunity on behalf of the office to seek a, a different outcome. And in the end, uh, we resolved it by a plea of just murder in the first degree without the aggravating factors. And so um, it was sort of a cop-out, if you will, in a sense that it didn't force me to sort of go through the whole process of sort of dealing with the death penalty case. I had the option of, I had the option of withdrawing from the case. Um, but as I said, the evidentiary issues um, became quite obvious early on. And so it allowed me to reach the negotiated settlement that I ultimately reached. Thank you so much. Um, we can actually open this up to questions from the floor. Do, does anybody have any additional questions to ask? And, and the responses to these would be one minute apiece. Um, you can raise your hand um, using the button that you guys have. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. I'm sure, uh, thank you, uh, Judge Lee. So um, the courts, like a lot of government, have been chronically underfunded. And in fact, they may even be, in a systemic sense, more underfunded than the rest of government just because there's fewer options and maybe fewer voices advocating for it. So I'm wondering how, as a judge, um, you would be able to, along with your colleagues, help advocate for more funding for not just the courts themselves, but the entire judicial system. Um, well, one is to lead by example. Um, and so one of the things I've made myself available for is what's known as settlement conferences. And these are um, free mediations um, conducted by the judge um, that are offered to people. And in my particular area, I've made it only available to people, um, low income um, folks. Um, because the typical mediation can cost three to over $4,000 a day. And I'm not sure why more of my colleagues uh, don't, uh, make themselves available for this, but it's something that I think is very important. So I think judges need to work again. We need to partner up with our local governments, also businesses, um, NGOs, and other charitable organizations in our community to find solutions to, for overcoming the challenges that we face that are all sort of leading back to budget. Ten seconds. We can improve interpreter services, true access to justice in terms of access to court records, um, as well as community-based treatment programs, which I think are key to any justice system. Great, thank you. Uh, Laura, you had a question. Hi there, are there any particular rotations uh, with the Superior Court that you are interested in? Um, yes, and so, well, let me just preface this. I, I would be interested in any rotation, and currently I'm assigned to the criminal department. Um, but the juvenile division is something that I would like to go back to. And by go back to, I mean that um, early in my career, I spent just under two years at the juvenile division, where um, I think that was where I felt um, as a prosecutor, given some discretion that I was most able seconds. to reach people um, that I was prosecuting. And it was more of a team multidisciplinary approach to finding solutions to kids to make sure that they didn't get um, caught up in a criminal justice system down the road and particularly in the adult system. So that's where, so that's somewhere I'd like to go back to, to find solutions um, so seconds. that we don't have juveniles constantly in a revolving door system um, in the criminal justice system. 
Great, thank you. Are there any other follow-up questions? Let me scroll through here. All right. So, I, okay, so I don't see anyone. I have one. Um, let's see here. Uh, what are the major influences in your life and why? Um, really, it's, it's my parents. Um, I'm, the, I'm an only child. Um, and as I said, we've lived in multiple countries, sometimes in very challenging situations. Um, you know, one of the things that really influenced my life and my, my philosophy and my way of thinking and how I conduct myself um, started. So right after I turned seven, um, the schooling system in Nigeria was obviously not really going to work out. Um, I was I learned a local dialect, but for my long-term future, that probably uh, my parents realized wasn't going to be the best outcome for me. So I was sent to a boarding school um, in England where a lot of expat factory workers where my dad was working did. Um, they sacrificed a lot to, to get me that education. Unfortunately, not realizing that the school I was sent to in its then 100 year history when I got there had never had a non-white student um, in its, amongst its population. So I, I was sort of the unwitting pioneer and faced a lot of physical and verbal bullying uh, with no one to turn to because my parents were still thousands of miles away. Um, but that experience and, and when I did get home for the holidays and how my parents sort of encouraged me, they ultimately gave me the choice, obviously, to leave that school. But they also taught me the value of sort of enduring, enduring challenges and trying to overcome them. That, you know, life is about making difficult choices and facing difficult decisions and, out, and obstacles. And it's how you overcome them and deal with them that I think builds character down the road. And so that's something they've instilled in me. I also talked about the community service. Um, they are um, what shaped me. I've lost both my parents, but it's how I've carried this over to my kids. I have three children and try to teach them the value of sort of sticking it out, facing adversity and trying to find ways to overcome it um, as best as possible. Um, not alone, with, with help and while leaning on people that they trust. Um, and so this is how basically I carry out my and conduct myself in daily life as well as my professional life. Thank you. Are there any other follow-up questions? We have a couple minutes left. Scroll through here. All right. I don't see any. I have one more. Uh, who are your judicial role models? Um, in terms of Superior Court bench locally, it would be um, Justice Bobby Bridge, who's retired. Um, I don't have time, but there was an incident that occurred in court, which when it happened, it signaled to me from her that, um, and I, this was early in my, uh, in my legal career, she gave me the okay to sort of step out of the box. And even though I didn't have discretion at that time from the office and just sort of had to follow orders and do what I was told to do, she seconds. basically gave me the okay to do what I think was right, um, regardless of my title and my job. And this is something after I did, we had a long conversation about it, and she thereafter became a mentor of mine. Um, on, the, on the national side, um, obviously, Ten seconds. Um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, again, because of the things that she had to overcome in her early life and her determination in overcoming all of those obstacles and nonetheless still being able to reach the pinnacle um, in judicial career that she has. So she has my admiration, obviously, for that. <clears throat> Great, thank you so much. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, you can go ahead and take a, uh, a minute to wrap up and tell people who might be viewing this video why they should vote for you. Well, again, thank you for the time. Um, I think people should vote for me to keep my seat on the Superior Court bench because I have a demonstrated um, past of um, both criminal and civil experience, which will be extremely important and all the more important 
once the stay at home um, order is lifted, because there are a number of back to back to back to back criminal trials that most certainly will be um, happening um, over the next foreseeable future. I also have the life experiences, I think, that will make me a fair and impartial judge and someone that the people of King County would be proud to have as a judge on the bench. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to hit 